Hello everybody, this is Dr. Jack Chuang. Thanks for coming back for another psychology lecture. And today we're going to focus on the chapter on personality, or often called personality theories within an introduction to psychology course. And this is one of the big ones, okay? So in any introduction to psychology course, um, you're going to get a broad overview of the variety of fields within psychology but if you really want to get a sense of the big ideas in psychology then you have to go to the personality course so yes uh, abnormal psychology or the disorders chapter is important the learning theories chapter is another big foundation as well as well but personality is the way to go so if you have electives in your college career left to fill, I highly recommend taking a separate personality theories course from your psychology department. I think it will be a great supplement to whatever else you're learning out there and a lot of great um, perspectives in terms of how to understand human behavior. So personality is a way to describe us right how we think feel and behave right and what you're going to notice here is that even though each personality theory is different has a very different perspective or way of understanding how we think feel and behave you'll see that the idea is to be able to come up with ways of explaining how people are similar or how people are different right and so keep that in mind as we go through each of these theorists and some are backed up by empirical evidence and scientific study and some just are not um, that there are more in a way philosophical ideas that are very difficult to test but at some level makes a lot of common sense right so if you want to think about how what your personality is made of how would you describe that right so it's about our thoughts our emotions these internal things as well as how we behave how we express ourselves right uh, represents our personality so in essence these theorists are trying to figure out how to explain us as people what makes us tick so that's why the personality chapter is such a fundamental chapter in understanding psychology. It goes to the root of what makes us who we are, right? Now, uh, like any of these chapters, there's just too much material to cover within a simple podcast and video lecture. So what I'm going to do is to, I am going to skip around a little bit, so don't be alarmed that, well, you skipped over three pages here. And again, I'm using the textbook. Uh, these uh, podcast lectures are based on the textbook that's free by o from OpenStax.org, O-P-E-N-S-T-A-X.org, and uh, it's based on their PowerPoint presentations. Okay, giving credit where credit is due. So if we start with Freud, what we're going to do here is talk about Sigmund Freud's central ideas, right, as a contributor to understanding our personality and then we'll move on to a set of neo-freudians meaning that they are contemporaries of freud within the same genre or field of psychology okay but neo as in newer they made alterations they have a vastly different take on our human personality compared to uh, Freud's original take because Freud's take if you look at its essence is quite a negative one about human nature all right so back to reviewing a little bit about Freud and we talked about Freud a little bit before is that his main one of his main tenets is that within our mind we have an unconscious level right it's almost instinctual so that if we don't control this animalistic instinct side of us right using the part that makes us human and we'll get to that in a moment called the ego 
then that's our eternal struggle right there is that our human side is trying to hold back our animalistic instinctual side right whether that's uh, aggression sex or uh, or other kinds of instinctual drives that we have right so Freud is trying to explain what makes us so-called normal using air quotes and what makes us abnormal so the neo Freudians I will talk about later and there are a handful of them is that well, if your hand has three fingers, okay, so I'll talk about three particular people. And also, in addition, we'll talk about Carl Jung, spelled J-U-N-G, who was actually a protege of Freud, okay? Um, but also, he veered off in his own version of psychoanalytic theory. Now, a lot of the neo-Freudians agreed with, that's why they're still within the field that Freud is in, but there's a lot less emphasis on the sexual energy and sexual aggression, um, and more focused on culture and social environment. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started in understanding uh, in terms of Freud's main principles. Well, let's go back to the unconscious mind. So we have the conscious and the unconscious, and some textbooks will include a level called the pre-conscious. And a lot of the metaphors they use tend to be of the ocean and water. So think of it this way, the shallow end of the or, or, or the uh, poolside or the sand beach part of it above the water level. Think of that as our conscious level. That is when we are fully aware of what our mind is thinking and what our body is feeling. Okay? Then we have the pre-conscious, which is sort of like you know ankle deep, shallow level of the swimming pool or the ocean or the beach. Then we have the unconscious level of our mind, which is the deepest depth of our uh, ocean okay or in our mind and so and, and some of these ideas really make sense because we can kind of think of them in our everyday lives that sometimes we forget things or we have things that happen to our past that might be traumatic that we don't remember in a way you can think of it Freud would think of it as your mind trying to save itself of those traumatic memories by shoving them deep down burying them literally okay figuratively in your mind okay and so one example of where the unconscious mind comes into play is these experiences we call Freudian slips, right? That sometimes we say things that are accidental, and maybe it's a word that rhymes with the word you're trying to say, but it kind of comes out anyway, or calling out the, the name of your ex instead of the current partner, right? Those kinds of things. We talked about that during the memory chapter, how that was called interference. And I told you, don't go to Freud, because Freud would say that, well, that was a representation of something you buried in your unconscious that seeped through the surface. So someone you deeply were thinking about suddenly seeped through. That's why instead of saying the name Priscilla, you said the name uh, Samantha, for example. Okay, random names. Okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's an example of a Freudian slip. So Freud would say that there are no accidents, right? So... You went to the fridge, you forgot what you really wanted to get, but you end up getting ice cream. Well, that's not an accident, right? So perhaps unconsciously you really were going for the ice cream. All right, the three parts uh, or the structure of our personality, according to Freud. And this, I believe, I have a separate podcast for, but I'll go ahead and talk about it here since we're doing longer form lectures now. But I have a separate one as well that you can listen to. It's going to be pretty much the same. So if Freud believed that our mind, our personality, is based on the, the struggle of balance between three different systems. So the first system is called the id, and there's a developmental aspect in that the id came first. So when we're born, that's all we have is the id, I-D. And the id is our unconscious level, our instinctual, impulsive part of us. And... It's very primitive. It just wants to satisfy hunger, thirst, okay? And even sexuality, even though we are talking about babies, okay? But as an adult, we basically want what feels good right now. So if you've ever heard the phrase immediate gratification, right? Well, there you go. You're using Freudian language, right? So this being, this part of us, the id, operates on the pleasure principle, okay? And we, whatever it is we want, we... It's not about 
whether it's convenient, whether it's socially appropriate, it doesn't really matter. If you are hungry, you will leave that meeting, storm out, drop everything, uh, smash through the vending machine, grab whatever it is, you know, eat the wrapper, whatever, and just, you know, like a zombie going out, you know, out of control. And at its core, that's what this is talking about, that we all have this primitive part of us, right? But fortunately, we're not wild animals all the time, and we have those kinds of urges under control. So if you're ever in a classroom or in a meeting where you're extremely thirsty or hungry, but you don't act on it, right? You act on it after class, and you act on it in a socially appropriate way without running over people and smashing through the vending machine with a chair, then there are other parts of your personality holding you in check. But when we lose control, right, and if Freud would watch uh, television news and see a group of people maybe uh, torching a car, you know, there's a big protest and the protest turns violent or something, then he would say that individually those people have, uh, they're controlled by their id, right? Or someone who has a sex addiction is a person controlled by their id. Someone who is a compulsive eater is controlled by their id, okay? That is, they have these urges that they want to fulfill, but they cannot control these urges. A serial killer kills to satisfy their id, their, their thirst for aggression and to torture others. They get gratification from that somehow okay so again scientifically can't prove it but it's a way of labeling right things that we can observe in people all right now what develops maybe around five or six according to freud is the super ego okay now the word ego first of all you got to think of it differently as how we normally think of it uh, is you know someone thinking who's really full of themselves the superego is our morality center, our moral compass. Now, if you think about it, where do we develop our beliefs about what's right versus wrong? Don't we get it from society, from our parents usually, and maybe our church and our peers, right? So that is the age that we're starting to integrate. Oh, don't do this because it's wrong, right? So if you're a little child chasing around the dog in the house and pulling on the tail and causing pain, right, someone's going to tell you that, oh, don't do that. And then we learn. So again, when Freud would say that, well, for a serial killer, you know, they usually start off by torturing animals, right? And then they, they move on to torturing people and killing people. Well, is it possible that at that moment that the child is harming an animal, no one was around or responsible, responsible enough to tell that child to stop doing that, to teach that child that that is something that's wrong? right because to the child you know at that age running around you know as a four or five year old they just think it's fun they may not have that ability to see that they're causing pain right so we have to be taught that so that's an internalization of the rules so then as we grow older our sense of right and wrong still stays with us like your mom or dad you know wearing these judge judy outfits on your shoulder telling you that oh that's really wrong so oftentimes when we feel guilt over something, right, think about where the, those voices come from in our head. They probably are repetitions of things. And if we're really hard on ourselves for making a mistake or we're perfectionistic and we tell ourselves, well, why can't we do better? Think about where those critical words come from. And according to Freud, they're likely echoes of critical statements made by someone in your lifetime as you were in those impressionable years, right? So for that serial killer who did not get that, Freud would say that, well, they have an underdeveloped superego and an overdeveloped id so that their urge to harm is not controlled by their superego, right? It's, there, there's no sense, their, their superego is not developed, so their judgment center, their morality compass is too small, too weak, right? Or non-existent, okay? And so... Let's think about the third part, and this comes in when we're just a little bit older than that, is the ego, and this is our sense of self. Now, the ego lives by the reality principle, right? So we cannot satisfy ourselves at any moment, OK? 
okay, we have to do it in a realistic way. And this is the part of our personality we show ex to the world, okay? It's more rational. Um, it's less impulsive, okay? So think of this. A lot of people confuse, a lot of students confuse the superego with the ego. They think that, well, you're not, not out there committing murder because the ego is holding you back and telling you that's wrong. That's not really the correct interpretation. The ego is a restraint on the id, but it's also trying to intervene with the superego, right? So, for example, let's say your neighbor, uh, neighbor's dog pooed on your yard, okay? And they didn't pick it up and you're really mad, right? If you were controlled by the id, you would go over there with a chainsaw and do bad things, okay? Uh, okay, it's, it's near Halloween when I'm recording this. All right, so that was if your id would take over. Now, if you had those thoughts, but you didn't act on them, right? Well, what the ego is going to do is to say, let's not kill him with a chainsaw today. We can kill him with a chainsaw later, okay? So it's like it's an instant break on the impulse, right? A pause. But then the super ego kicks in and tells you, you know, like your mom's voice, uh, you know, son, killing someone with a chainsaw has dire consequences. You know, it's really not the right thing to do in society, okay? And so that's where the superego comes in. Remember, the superego is the moral center, the judge, okay? And, and again, remember, the superego is the one that pats you on the back and also is the one that criticizes you. So feelings of pride, when you celebrate for doing something right, that's your superego talking, even though you're celebrating by yourself, right? And if you're self-critical in a room all by yourself, that also is your superego at play. So you have the ego, superego, and the id. And these three parts are interacting, right? And so a healthy personality is where the id and the superego is managed by the ego, right? Uh, in a healthy way so that, yes, of course, you have urges to do things, but the ego has it under control. You have a very strong sense of morality of what's right and wrong, right? And then Freud would argue that if you have some sort of imbalance between these three components, then you're going to end up with what's called a neurosis, right? You're going to experience negative emotions. You're going to have anxiety. You're going to have unhealthy behaviors, compulsive, addictive behaviors, right? Because the id, usually the id, is out of control. Or you're overwhelmed with guilt. That's where the anxiety can come from, from an overdeveloped superego, right? And, and a weak ego system. Now, an extension of this, so that's the three parts of personality, is that we oftentimes have ego defense mechanisms, okay? This is where the ego, who's the chief, tries to save us, right, by altering our perception of events that are happening to reduce the amount of stress that we're going to experience. And sometimes it has actually negative consequences. So if you're watching on YouTube, this particular slide is it's a little bit, the font is kind of small, but I'll walk you through some examples. The biggest example is denial. Denial, okay? That's where a person just absolutely refuses to accept whatever is going on, okay? For example, they may be an addict. They may smoke cigarettes too much. They may, in Asia, maybe they're chewing too much betel nut. Okay, I used that as an example in a previous podcast. So whatever that is, and the person truly believes that they don't have a problem, then that's denial. Because to admit to it would be kind of an overwhelming thing, right? So the ego is pushing out the truth to save that person. Saying, well, I don't have a problem, so I'm not going to feel all distressed. Okay, I'm not going to admit that I have this issue. And so that's denial. Sometimes we as students did that, right, or do that. Uh, maybe you have a lot of assignments piling up and we deny that we have them. That's a little bit far-fetched. But even when we minimize, right, minimize an event, saying, oh, it's not so bad. You know, it's only a golf ball-sized thing growing on my neck. I, I don't have to see the doctor, okay? That is a partial denial. And that's a process of minimizing, all right? Also, now let's look at the second one, displacement, right? Think about this. Oftentimes, we 
uh, are angry at one target, target A, but we take it out on target B, right? Well, if we're angry at work, you might lose your job if you yell at your boss. Instead, we come home and yell at our dog or yell at our children, right? That is equally as bad, right, in everyday life. You're harming someone. But the ego is saying that, well, of the two, I'm choosing to redirect this hostility to save your job, right? Uh, a man punches the wall, punches a hole through the wall during an argument. That is extremely aggressive and unacceptable, right? But according to Freud, that is a better alternative than actually throwing the punch at the person, you see? So this is a form of displaced anger and aggression. We normally would say that there is nothing good coming out of it, but from Freud's point of view, the ego is trying to an attempt to save that person. Yes, there, it's still bad and there are negative consequences and you should have consequences for that behavior but even with denial right it's the ego in an earnest attempt to try to save that person's sanity even though it's not really helping them does that make sense okay projection is uh an amazing thing projection is where we throw out to someone else Right, accusing someone of something unacceptable that deep down at an unconscious level you are doing yourself. Right? So it's accusing someone else of something you're actually doing. And this has a lot of times this has to do with jealousy or accusing our spouse or our partner of flirting with someone when in actuality you're the one cheating or flirting. Okay. So it's kind of like a preemptive strike. If I attack the person and put them on the defensive right then then I don't have to defend myself okay they have to be on the defensive and so that may not be a totally conscious process that's part of it that's the ego saying that I'm gonna save myself of being grilled by my wife but instead I'll confront her with what she's doing wrong and often the person on the receiving end of that has no clue like what the heck is going on and you may see this a lot in politicians right uh, oftentimes they project this sense of and over the history of the of the u.s congress and the senate you've probably seen cases of someone who was found guilty of a particular crime where they were actually the head of an organization to try to fight that particular crime okay whether it's protecting children but they abuse children you see so they're in fact projecting that out okay um okay rationalization right and, and if a lot of these words sound familiar, they kind of, we kind of use them in everyday language. Think how powerful that is and how much influence Freud had to, to label these and explain these in a way that we can all, in a sense, relate to them. Now, when we rationalize something, it just means that we're giving ourselves excuses for why it's okay, right? And so, for example, uh, someone who cheats on their taxes might say that, well, the government is just wasting my money anyway. Why should I pay my taxes, you see? So in a sense, it's the ego protecting yourself so you don't have to feel bad or feel guilt, right, over not paying your taxes, which is something you legally need to do, right? And, uh, and so we can easily rationalize these kinds of things. And, uh, and let me just walk through maybe just a couple more. Um, repression. Um, is where we literally bury an unpleasant experience, right? So you can see how that's a very, it almost sounds like denial, right? But it's its literally not remembering something. So uh, several years ago, my parents, this is many years ago, they happened to break down coming to visit us where we're living. So while the car was being fixed here, they drove one of our cars back home. And our car had very dark tinted windows and it was at night, it was raining and they had their friend in the back seat. They went to some sort of social function. And when they left, trying to leave the parking lot, and again, it was raining, it was dark, they were sideswiped by an ambulance, right? And almost killed. And, and luckily, because of the location of the impact, they did not suffer serious injuries. They were just very much jarred, right? And so my parents to this day, or at least my dad, my mom passed away several years ago, but my dad would, and I remember at the time, they both said that they don't really remember anything about the accident. They just remember sort of waking up uh, and being more conscious at the hospital, even though they were completely conscious throughout the whole event. So their backseat friend remembers everything, 
because they weren't as close to the impact as sitting in the front. So she would describe that, oh yeah, I came from here and we spun around and all that, and my parents don't remember any of that. So one could argue that this repressed memory serves a positive function because the ego is pushing this very unpleasant thought and memory out of their consciousness, right? It's a coping mechanism. Um, anyway, so let me finish with sublimation. This is a funny one because sublimation is where we redirect so what we normally think of as unacceptable desires but channel that energy into socially acceptable behaviors, right? That's called sublimation. And so this can come in, in many different forms. It could be about aggression, right? Um, the example in the book uses the example of Jerome's desire for revenge on a drunk driver who killed his son is channeled into a community support group for people. All right, so they turned an unacceptable desire into something fairly acceptable, right? And so that's an example of sublimation. Now, sexual energy can happen as well. For example, someone goes on a, a business trip, right? A, a partner, a spouse, right? And because they're separated and they don't have their usual sexual intimacy, suddenly they compensate by redirecting that pent-up sexual energy into socially acceptable activities like cleaning the house or taking on another project or, or whatever, okay? So <laughs> if you think about that rationale, if you are away from your spouse for a week and you talk to them on the phone and ask them how their day is and their, their day is exactly the same as when you were home, then maybe you should be suspicious, you know? If they tell you that, oh, yeah, I scrubbed the driveway, you know, and this, then maybe that's a good sign that they're sublimating. They're taking their that pent-up sexual energy and rechanneling it into uh, more acceptable activities. Okay, so there you go. There are, there's a list, long list of examples of here of what are called ego defense mechanisms. And some have good consequences. Some maybe have maladaptive consequences, actually, right? Like you don't want to be in denial about an addiction you don't want to project and accuse someone of something they're not doing to protect yourself right and these are very much unconscious aspects okay all right now the stages of psychosexual development i just covered in detail in the lifespan uh, podcast okay and so you want to go there to refer to that one but that one's very interesting but the, the main idea is that our these childhood experiences and stages that we go through in conflicts have a, an effect on our later adult personality, okay? There's a connection, and this is also a Freudian, very controversial Freudian idea, so let me go ahead and move on. All right, Alfred Adler is one of the Neo-Freudians, okay? And I like Adler's idea. Remember, he, he these Neo-Freudians are still psychoanalysts, so they believe in the unconscious mind, okay? And... The, the main tenet of Adler's idea is that we, deep down, have these feelings of, of inferiority, right? Um, feeling inadequate. And so what motivates us in our life is to push these deep inner feelings of inferiority down. To the, to the, we want to bury it as much as possible, right? And so if, if you think about the other extreme, right? So we want to have a balance of not feeling inferior, but we want to have experiences that are positive, right? So the other extreme is the superiority complex. And we want to be somewhere sort of in between. We want to have things that we accomplish, we do things, we gain a work, we win a trophy, we get a, a job promotion, right? The more accomplishments we have, the less weak we will feel. The, we will not feel this sort of inner sense of uh, inadequacy. That's, that's a better word for it, right? But what happens when we try too hard to push down this inferiority? Then we have a superiority complex, okay? Meaning someone really is overconfident, feels highly of themselves, that they can do no wrong, right? 
And so one way to look at a person like that is that, well, what are they trying to cover up? Right? How can someone be so narcissistic as to feel that they're so superior and they have, they're always bragging about their accomplishments? Right? I am Dr. Jack Chuang, PhD, right? So normally a person wouldn't use the doctor and the PhD. So if you use both, that could be a problem, right? And so, uh, so in, in our lives, in a variety of contexts, this is the struggle between inferiority and superiority, okay? And ideally, you want to have a balance of in between. Now, Eric Erickson, also a psychoanalyst, proposed the psychosocial theory of development where we go through eight different stages and conflicts and this is also described in more detail in the lifespan chapter all right so you want to head over there um, and basically to be a healthy adult hopefully we have gone through these eight challenges in our lives eight conflict stages in a balanced way right and each one is associated with a particular age range in our life that's why it fits in well with lifespan psychology. All right, Carl Jung is, was Sigmund Freud's star student, okay? And here are some major concepts that Jung uh, believed in, okay? Uh, and I think that uh, one of the, the main ones here, and he's much more of a, seems to come across as more spiritual and, and positive than Freud, definitely positive. Everyone else is positive compared to Freud that we have a collective unconscious, all right? And what are these collective, un what is this collective unconscious? It's sort of like a place where we have memories uh, that all of us have in common. It's something that connects all human beings the moment we're born, okay? So instead of just having a personal unconscious level, there's almost a connection we have uh, between every human being is what, is what connects us, okay? And these specific patterns and concepts are called archetypes, right? These are the universal themes across various cultures that connect us, that are common around, uh, for around the world. So no matter whether one lives in a remote Aboriginal tribe or live in a modern city, right? Um, think about things that connect us as human beings, right? Love, hate, concept of a hero, versus the concept of victim, uh, motherhood, nurturing, right? Uh, being a provider, right? A lot of these are very common types of themes that are archetypes and they, they exist within our collective unconscious. That's why we can get it when we see a foreign film, right? We, we kind of understand what's happening to certain characters. We feel the pain that someone is experiencing in that in that context, okay? Carl Jung also talked about the persona, right? And this is uh, figuratively a mask that we put on to show the public, right? And so the idea is that we're hiding our true selves versus a more public self, okay? And for us to be mentally healthy, there's got to be a compromise between the two Otherwise, we're not really, if there's a huge disconnect between our true self and the public self, and that could present psychological problems that we may experience. Okay? Now, another concept that Carl Jung was very famous for was this personality trait that uh, a range where we can either be an introvert or an extrovert. Right? Now, it's a lot more complex than simply being shy and social. Okay? Uh, an introvert values being alone. This is someone who is exhausted by being around people and, and is relieved by coming home. Yeah? And they don't really need a lot of attention. They tend to be soft-spoken. They, they're very thoughtful before they speak. Right? They don't just ramble on. So you can probably guess that maybe I'm not an introvert. <laughs> uh, they're very focused on one topic when they speak. They prefer written communication because that involves being more thoughtful, right? Um, they're very focused. They can pay attention, and they're more or less cautious, right? This is according to Jung. Now, the opposite of that, the extrovert, and, and a lot of us could be in between, okay? So don't think of it as an either-or dichotomy. 
So an extrovert, you gain your energy from being around people, from social situations. So I think of a Friday evening at the end of the work week, what would the introvert want to do compared to an extrovert? Well, the introvert would think of that as an opportunity to be by themselves with a book or watch a movie on their, by themselves on their, on their device, right? Um, so they can have a chance to unwind. They value that time. It's re-energizing. But for the extrovert, they're dying to go through their phone list and connect with people, right? To go out and do something together and... Uh, so this is someone who seeks attention, talking about the extroverts. They tend to speak quickly and loudly. They think out loud. <laughs> that is very much me. And they jump from topic to topic. Yeah, I think that's me too. And they prefer verbal communication. Gee, yeah, that's me. Highly distractible. Uh, yeah. Oh, squirrel. Um, and they tend to act for, well, I don't know. Do I do that? Do I act first and think later? I hope not. But... You can see that there, there's some personality traits that are different between these introverts and extroverts. And this concept was actually borrowed and used in a very popular um, personality test called the Myers-Briggs Personality uh, Inventory, where you come up with a, end up with a four letter code like ENTJ or IN, uh, ISF, uh, let's see, what's the last one? Judge, oh, P. Okay. And so the I and the E represents introvert versus extrovert. So that's a main feature in that particular personality test. And, and that's very popular in the workplace for human resources people to come do a talk and talk about personality and give that test to employees. All right. Now, another Neo Freudian is, and please pronounce her name correctly. Karen Horney. It's German, okay? Not Karen Horney. You get in a lot of trouble. All right. So, like Jung, Karen Horney believed that uh, we have the goal to be good, okay? To reach self realization. But let me talk about uh, her claim to fame, okay? Now, we didn't get to this directly today, but Freud was very much male-centric in his theories and used the term called penis envy, right, uh, during one of the stages of psychosocial development, that girls are envious of boys because of the extra part they have, right? But Karen Horney, perhaps being ahead of her time, actually flip that around, that men feel inadequate because we as men do not have the ability to bear children. Therefore, we suffer from an unconscious womb envy, right? And again, this is not conscious, right? Men don't wake up and go, oh, I don't have a uterus. I can't have babies, right? So this is an unconscious uh, feeling of inadequacy. So just like when we talked about Adler, that we try to accomplish things in life to push down the feelings of inadequacy or inferiority. As men, the reason we're chasing status and a title and a golf trophy on weekends is because we can't give birth. So we compensate at an unconscious level. We make up for this weakness by working long hours, trying to be the VP of the company and so forth, right? Okay, so I know the ladies out there, you probably like this a lot. So, you know, make a bumper sticker if you like. Okay, so um, a lot of the Karen Horney's ideas are based on this idea of unconscious anxiety, and that's what we're talking about here. And so throughout our lives, what we're trying to do is to balance this, to try to push down this unconscious anxiety. And... The basic anxiety has to do with our connections with people, right? So you're going to see a list of three ways to cope, right? Now here is labeled as used by children, but it can also be used by adults to compensate for this anxiety, to keep the anxiety at bay so we don't experience it. So one thing we can do is that we can move towards people, right? 
So if we're alone and we feel anxiety from being alone, this kind of makes sense. Moving towards people means to gain some affiliation, be part of a group, to meet our needs for love and acceptance, right? Number two, we move against people sometimes, right? Sometimes we uh, need to actually uh, talk back to someone, right? Assert ourselves, okay? So adults, this means lashing out, okay? Maybe hurting others, being aggressive and assertive. Those are different things, right? Um, so maybe sometimes telling off our boss, right? To relieve certain anxiety of being dominated by someone else. And then the third one, oops, the graphic says two and two, so it's number three. Moving away from people, right? This is where we try to gain a sense of independence, okay? Uh, or a way to get rid of an unhealthy relationship. So we move away. So these are three types of coping mechanisms we have to handle our everyday anxieties, okay? So there are a couple of concepts here from Karen Horney within her theoretical framework right there's womb envy and then men make up for it this womb envy by working and and uh, and gaining a lot of status and those kinds of things accomplishments and then we have the three styles of coping to relieve anxiety moving towards people against people and away from people okay that's karen horney all right let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the category of humanistic psychology or humanism and how that relates to our personality. Again, if you want to go to the a different podcast, the chapter on motivation, you'll see a more in-depth explanation of Abraham Maslow, who is one of the founding fathers of humanistic psychology. And the basics of human humanistic approach is about is a very positive view of human nature that we're basically born good and we're striving to be good throughout our lives, right? And so uh, the Maslow hierarchy of needs explained this. And again, you can look at it um, in a different podcast for, for some more details. But basically, in, throughout our lives, we're trying to meet certain needs that are loftier and higher and have a grander purpose. Carl Rogers, who's known for creating a form of therapy called client-centered therapy, or it's also named after his name, Ro Rogerian therapy, is a co-founder of humanistic um, psychology, right? And he talks about how each of us has a self-concept. This is our thoughts and feelings that we have about ourselves. So think of it as a bubble that we contain all of these things that we feel about ourselves. So hopefully it's full of more positives than negatives, right? And that affects our personality. That's one of the cores of our personality. Now, this self is divided between, and this is similar to Carl Jung and his persona, that we have an ideal self, person maybe we want to be, versus the real self, the person that we are at the moment, okay? And so the goal is that we need to find a balance, a sense of congruence, that means balance, right, between these two selves, the ideal and the real, okay? And if we actually can have a congruence where the real self is the ideal self, right? Then we reduce a lot of conflicts, right? If your real self uh, calls you to lie to customers, I mean, sorry, your ideal self, right? Uh, no, let me flip that up. <laughs> All right, so if your real self, okay, um, at your job that you're actually doing is that you're deceiving customers because that's what you're told to do, but ideally, you don't really, you think of yourself as an honest person with integrity, right? That's going to create a lot of conflict, okay? So the more that you can match up, let's say using your job as an example, the things that you do at work basically fall in line with your values and how you see yourself, then the healthier we are. That kind of makes sense, right? So if we have high congruence, meaning that the ideal and the real self match up, then we're going to have a greater sense of self-worth, better health, and a more product productive life. If there's incongruence, right, that is our real everyday self is so far removed and different from our ideal self, then we're going to experience a lot of maladjustment, maladjustment, right? So um, 
could be negative emotions and so forth. Um, now, one thing that's really interesting that's not really discussed in this particular slide is that Carl Rogers is also known for um, something we talk about in parenting, and that's unconditional love. But he termed it unconditional self-regard, right? That is, we need to receive this, and we need to give this to young people, meaning that we value them regardless of the actions they've done, good or bad, right? That our value for, our, for this person that we love is separate from the actions. In other words, we don't place conditions on it. We don't say that I give you more love because you're a good student, and I give you less love because you dropped out of high school, you see? So this has nothing to do with discipline and punishments, right? Because what we're disciplining and punishing our children for is their behavior, not for their for them. Now, we're not punishing them. We're punishing their behavior. So there's a difference, right? And so that's why a mother can still love their son who's on death row, right, and visit them every week, even though they may have done something very wrong and heinous, right? Um, and so this is called unconditional self-regard. When we provide that to someone, then that someone will grow up with a much healthier self-concept, right? Meaning that they're going to have a more flexible self-concept. That is, oh, you know, I can choose any career and I still get the same love from my parents, right? I can choose to be an artist, make maybe make a little bit less money than if I were an engineer, but it's equally acceptable to my parents. They love me, not my profession, right? So that's unconditional love. So if we give those kinds of messages, such as when a boy hurt himself, you know, falling down, and they cry, and we say, hey, it's okay, just let it out, right? We don't judge. We don't uh, dismiss them if they don't behave a certain way. We don't give them more love if they act tough. Hey, suck it up, you know, be a man, right? Then what happens is, is that their self-concept is going to be more flexible. They understand that as a man, that I can have a wide range of emotions, right? Then that's a healthier person than a man who believes that they can only express three kinds of emotion and not six kinds of emotions, right? They're less flexible. So being flexible uh, and have that flexible and healthy self-concept comes from getting these unconditional messages growing up, right? Not conditional messages. So conditional messages for the recipient can be very harmful. It makes for a more rigid personality instead of a flexible, you know, personality, someone who can roll with the punches and adapt to situations, right? I'll give you one more example before I move on. Culturally speaking, and this is from my experience working with uh, clients in the past, is that I've worked with men of Hispanic background. This is in the VA system, so they're veterans, right? So as a, as a veteran, they prided the fact that, that they're strong, but also in, the, in terms of their family life, that they're providers, right? So a disabled male veteran who's not able to work and is taking a disability check, right? Think about their self-concept, how they define themselves, right? If they define themselves in a very rigid way based on culture, based on upbringing, that you're the man, the man needs to be strong and needs to be a provider. Well, he's no longer physically as strong and is no longer as uh, strong a provider financially. And what if the roles are reversed? What if the wife or the spouse becomes a breadwinner working two jobs and he has to stay at home and be the parent, right? So if that person has a rigid self-concept that comes from those conditional messages, you're a man only if you do A, B, and C, not if you do D, E, and F, right? Think about it. That's a conditional message, right? You're only a man if, okay? Then that person is going to have a harder time adjusting, right, to the changes that happen to his life. So one particular patient or client that I worked with, I used this model, and we discussed this and have him explore what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a husband, to be a provider? Can being a provider means that you provide in different ways besides the money? By being a stay-at-home dad, are you not 
essentially a provider. Can we admit that being a stay-at-home mom is harder work than going to an 8-to-5 job? Then aren't you doing the harder work right now, right? And so it, you can't do this in one session of therapy, but it took a while to chip away at this, this self-concept that was made out of this hard material, you know, made out of stone, and we have like taking a chisel and chiseling away at it to make it more flexible, right? Uh, it's like someone practicing yoga, and finally they're able to bend a different way. And then he was happy. He, he, he didn't feel as inadequate hanging out with his guy friends, being a stay-at-home dad on disability. He was able to adjust and redefine his self-concept. So you see how the, the Rogers... So you see how even in therapy that we'll talk about at a later time, uh, a therapist has to help their clients, but you have to have a strategy. You have to have a theoretical framework to try to understand people and therefore have a strategy on how to help people. All right. Now, we've looked at psychoanalysts. We looked at humanistic psychology. Now, another category to try to explain our human personality are trait theories, okay? So most of these personality tests that you've seen where you come up with that like Myers-Briggs four-letter code, that's an example of a trait theory. It's the idea that each of us, our personalities are made up of ingredients, right? Kind of like a fast food combo meal, right? Someone might be a Big Mac shake and a soda, right? Uh, well, that's a lot of sugar. How about some fries, right? And another person could be a fish sandwich and chicken nuggets and milk, you see? So we all have these categories, but how we fill in the categories might be different. So, th so if we overlap with other people and we get a sense that, hey, we're kind of similar, then a trait theorist would say that, well, that's because you have certain traits in common. If you feel like you're conflicting with someone, you just don't get along with them, then a trait theorist would say that, well, that's because you have certain traits that are in the opposite direction with that person, okay? Um, all right, so historically speaking, that's the target of these trait theorists. So we can go from Gordon Allport to Raymond Cattell, and they try to come up with, well, the human being could be explained in three major traits, or maybe Allport try to define personality in 16 different dimensions, right? So they gather information through a lot of survey research and then try to use statistical models to try to break apart in terms of how many different types of people out there, how many different personality categories and labels can we come up with, right? And so these were some early attempts at that. And some examples include uh, Hans and Sybil Isink, who uh, utilized... Carl Jung's introversion and extroversion as an example of a personality dimension that you're one extreme or the other or maybe in between, right? And also the other one they came up with, neuroticism and stability. Are you someone who's very stable mentally or do you worry a lot, right? You're more emotionally unstable or are you somewhere in between? So you can see this particular chart that has those four particular quadrants, right? And that each person is going to be a reflection of somewhere on this particular chart. And many trait theorists theories have this component to it. So I'm kind of glossing over this a little bit. Now, one of the more accepted or the most accepted trait theories is called the five factor model. Now you can search for this online in case you can't see this uh, graphic very clearly. But these five dimensions, and, and it's a range of low versus high, right? The first one being and, and there are a wide variety of uh, theorists who have uh, helped this five-factor model evolve over time. So it's not just a simple person, one or two researchers who are credited with the five-factor model. So you have the openness to experience, right? So someone was sco pr score pretty low, which means they kind of like to do things in a routine, do the things that they know, and... Uh, trying new th versus the other extreme of oh, someone who's willing to try a lot of different things and try a lot of and just think about food as just one example I think amongst all the people you know and your friends or family you can probably rate them from a low to high on this one dimension right you probably know people that just won't even try anything new especially if it's ethnic food that's different than what they're used to right 
Uh, there, I can have a whole discussion about ethnic food, by the way, and how Chinese food in America is really not ethnic food. Okay, so then the second dimension is conscientiousness. So someone can score very low on this, um, and someone can score very high on this. I think uh, an, the ultimate test for conscientiousness that I would imagine is when someone's drying their hands in a restroom and uses a paper towel, right, and they throw the paper towel at the trash can and miss. This is my take on it. Someone who scores low in conscientiousness would just leave it there. Someone who scores high in conscientiousness would go and pick it up, right? It's a lot more complicated than that, but that could be one example. Extroversion, okay? Now, remember, this is about scoring low versus high. So instead of labeling it introversion to extroversion, only the word extroversion is used here as the third dimension. So if you score low, that means you're more introverted. You prefer to be by yourself. You're more withdrawn versus being more outgoing, social amongst people if you score high. Then the fourth dimension is agreeableness, right? Um, whether you just choose to, uh, you're more critical. And think about how this is applied in today's social media. You know, these, these models were invented pre-social media. So you can see this really right away. There are people who just love to argue for the sake of arguing, right? And then there are others who are more trusting and empathetic and just go along with the group, right? And prefer group harmony, and that's more agreeableness. But there are trolls out there who just like to stir things up, so they probably score low on agreeableness. And just like Isink's uh, theory earlier, neuroticism. So those who score low, which means they're very calm and even-tempered, right? Sort of level, you know, emotionally they don't jump up and down too much, right? They're very consistent. Versus someone who scores high in neuroticism, which means maybe small events would trigger a big stress response, right? And the memory mnemonic, you can use the word ocean. O is for openness, C for conscientiousness, E for extroversion, A for agreeableness, and N for neuroticism. There's your memory trick of the day. So this is a classic example of a fairly agreed upon uh, trait theory. Okay. All right, now I'll shift gears a little bit in terms of personality and talk about how culture can affect our personality, right? How we think, feel, and behave. And if you think about it, culture is an environment that influences how we think, feel, and behave. It has to do with traditions, belief systems, right? And so how do personality traits vary across cultures, right? Are there certain patterns that you can see in different cultures? And yes, there is one. So let me go to the next screen here and we'll talk about this one. Um, all right, this one over here. Individualistic versus collectivistic cultures, right? Now, this is going to be a little bit of a gross generalization, and it's not fair to do so because in any given country, there's quite a bit of diversity, right? But in general, Western industrialized countries like the U.S., England, Australia, right? Primarily people of Caucasian descent, European descent, tend to lean toward the individualistic mindset, right? They focus a lot on personal achievement. If you look at interviews of Olympic athletes, you see this right away, that if you interview typically an American athlete, right, the focus of the camera in the interview is going to be the athlete themselves. Oh, you won the gold medal for the 100-meter dash. How do you feel? Blah, 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 right? They said, well, I trained really hard. Yeah, da, 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 okay? And if it's an athlete from an Asian, African, or South American country, right, and if they're from a collectivist culture, guess what they will say? I remember clearly there was, a, there was an interview, a uh, YouTube video, I think, that compared the two. And when they interviewed a Japanese athlete for why they won, the interviewer, who's Japanese, actually went straight to the coach, right? Because there's an understanding that without the coach and the staff, the athletes would not be able to succeed, right? It's group-oriented, team-oriented, not athlete-centered, not individualized, okay? So it's a collective effort. Now, people in collectivist cultures value social harmony, okay? It's about getting along, 
the group needs supersede the individual needs. Now, I normally try not to date these videos and lectures, but this is recorded in October during COVID in, in the year 2020, okay, in case I use this next year and the year after that. Well, there seems to be a difference in how people interpret the use of medical masks, right? Now, I've been in Taiwan and I've lived in Thailand, right, for in, in both countries. So I kind of seen and, and understand that many people wear masks anyway because they're on motorbikes, they ride public transportation, and it's, there's an understanding that if you're having some symptoms of anything, a cold, and you're going to ride the subway, that you should wear a mask. And no one says anything about it. No one stares at you because a lot of people wear masks. If you don't, that's fine if you don't have any symptoms. But when there's a pandemic and there's something contagious going around, it is so easy within many Asian countries for people to comply, right? Because of this collectivist nature. Uh, I don't see many people really discussing it in the greater news media, but I believe this is one of the contributing factors for why we wear masks. And I, I was gonna do a separate podcast about this subject actually. All right, so th I just wanted to put that in there. Whereas in, in the US, we're so individually oriented, right? We value our individual freedoms and now we also have, uh, we politicize the use of masks. That's another, of course, another aspect of this is that, well, it's a personal choice. Everything's a personal choice, right? So the focus is on the individual person's needs, not so much the need of the collective. Because in a sense, we know now that wearing a medical mask is about protecting the other person. Wearing medical masks don't protect you. They're not designed that way. They're designed to protect the person next to you. That's why everyone needs to wear a mask, because then you're protecting each other, right? So having a sense of bravado and saying, I don't need to wear a mask, I'm young and healthy, that's, that's not the point. It's not about that person, it's about the person next to you, which is why you need to wear a mask. And a lot of people assume that the mask wearer is the one trying to protect themselves. Well, only certain types of masks, those industrial masks are for that, protecting the worker, N95s, right? Those are different than medical masks. All right, so that's that's just a quick example of that. And, and let me give you one more example before we uh, move on and finish up here. Uh, and when my wife used to work at MD Anderson Cancer Center her, as a social medical social worker, this is many years ago, and this is in Houston, Texas, a very famous cancer hospital. Just bragging about her for a moment, okay. In her office, all right, there are about a dozen people sharing this really fairly large office space. And she thought, wouldn't it be great that, um, because once we got married, we have double of things, like two microwaves and all that. So she brought a microwave to use for everyone to share. And being of Asian descent, she's Myanmar American, okay, Burmese. She assumed, being from a collectivist mindset, that everyone would just pitch in and just take turns just wiping it down, cleaning the microwave. In other words, she was thinking that the office mates would think of it as everyone's microwave, right? Well, being that there are many people of Western descent in that office, guess what? A conflict developed. Most people did not clean the microwave, right? Because those people thought of it as my wife's microwave, that it was not their microwave. Have you ever been in a break room at work where sadly there has to be a sign on the fridge in the microwave saying, please, you know, people may have to even sign up on a day of the week and say, okay, this person has to clean this day. In a collectivist environment, you do not have to do that. People just take it upon themselves because they share in that item, in that space to clean up. It doesn't matter. It's common space, not my space and your space. Okay. So she got very frustrated. She even brought a little water dispenser, right? And I remember helping her take it home. She was so pissed. <laughs> oh, my coworkers are so selfish. They won't, you know, they won't even help out clean up after themselves, you know, that kind of thing. And I tried to explain that, and she understood. I didn't have to explain anything, but it's like, you know, it's one of those things. She goes, okay, stop lecturing me. I don't need that. All right, but that's an example of an individualistic versus collectivistic, okay? All right.
Well, uh, let me just talk really, really briefly about uh, personality tests, right? And these are often used in situations where, um, like forensic psychologists, they often give it to the person who is standing trial, who might be to assess whether or not they can stand trial, whether they have any psychological issues. And in my, my training in the hospital, we use these. One of the more common ones is called the MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. And this one is 300 plus questions, typically yes, no questions. And each question doesn't even seem like, well, what, what is this even tapping into? They seem so innocent and irrelevant. Do you like mechanics magazines? You know, questions like that. Well, the way this works is that in a lot in other personality inventories where, where it relates to being used clinically, the way they these tests work is that these tests are given large scale to many patients and to healthy people, okay, who are not suffering from symptoms. And the pattern of answers are correlated between people with very specific psychological disorders and symptoms versus healthy people and how they answer it, right? So it's not about how someone answers one particular item. It's about clumps and patterns, right? And statistically, when someone new takes the test, it's compared to that data set and to say that, well, this person has a certain likelihood of this disorder. Now, remember that a clinician does not create a diagnosis for a patient based on one test, or one clinical interview, or one blood test, okay? It has to do with a holistic gathering of information, right? Even interviews with family members, perhaps, and medical history and those kinds of things, okay? So this is just one component of that. So the MMPI works in that way, is that, um, and this is called an objective test because um, there are there's multiple choice or true false okay the, that's what's considered an objective test in other words the patient is not writing in their own unique answer okay so a likert scale is basically a technique when you've probably taken many surveys that use it where the answers are range like one to seven one to five uh, and from strongly agree to strongly disagree so if you've ever seen a response pattern like that then that's a likert scale type of personality test or, or any kind of survey rather like customer service satisfaction tend to use these all right now the MMPI tends to use a true false model okay on the test so it's relatively quick actually to finish up the 300 plus questions because you don't have to think too much about it all right now what's different than an objective test is a projective test, okay? Now, remember projection. We talked about Freud, right? We, we throw something out there, like accuse someone of something we're doing. Well, projective tests are tapping into our unconscious, okay? And trying to measure it in a semi-objective way. The most famous projective test to try to dig into our unconscious is the Rorschach ink blot test. Now, you've probably seen a lot of television shows make fun of this sort of idea showing an ink blot test. Oh, I see rats, you know, whatever, right? And so, again, it's not about just one test and one resp person responding to it and suddenly we can make interpretations. It's about correlation with large-scale data set. If people who have psychotic symptoms or have schizophrenia or have depression tend to answer a particular ink blot a certain way, right? Remember, it's not multiple choice. It's, it's a verbal answer when shown the card, right? And then the clinician will score it, right? And plug it into a database and they will come back and say, well, this person has leans towards a likelihood of this disorder or that disorder, right? So if you were to take, and that's why these cards are secure, right? Uh, hopefully they're not spread out there on the internet because the problem is, is that once these cards are publicly available and familiar to people, then it loses its effectiveness because you're going to sit there in a the doctor's office and look at it and say, oh yeah, I've seen that before and this is what people said and it's going to influence one's answer, right? And so that, um, so the inkblot results 
you know, even if you think you're crazy, oh, sorry, I shouldn't use the word crazy, you know, but if someone commonly thinks of themselves as that, as being abnormal, and they say, well, I'm afraid to answer what I see, I see a couple of, you know, uh, you know, dancing geese, and or one slashing the throat of the other, you know, that kind of thing, and if it turns out that that's a very common answer, common perception from healthy people, then you have no problem, right, so the, the goal is to answer as honestly as possible. Now, another kind of commonly used projective test, and I've also used this before back in my training days, is called the TAT, the Thematic Apperception Test. And this is where uh, drawings on cards that show sort of a scene, like someone standing next to a window, someone alone in a room, that kind of thing. And then you're asked the patient, you ask the patients, well, what do you see here? Right? Make a story out of this, okay? And this kind of stories they reveal can give you a lot of information that maybe just by talking that kind of information would not come out. Okay, so it's an it's a doorway, it's, it's a window to the unconscious. Right. Then there's another one called the Rotter Incomplete Sentence Blank, R I S B Rotter Incomplete Sentence Bank, and these are incomplete questions where someone fills in the blank. Right. So by filling in the blank also gives us as clinicians some insight into what could be what this person can be suffering from. And I believe this is also compared to a larger database of responses from healthy versus those who are suffering from disorders. Okay. And this is an example of the rotter incomplete sentence blank. You can see how it's open-ended. Right, so the answer is an example of a projection of their deepest thoughts. I feel, I regret, at home, dot, 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 my mother, dot, 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 right? my greatest worry, right? And so if someone is fighting and trying to, uh, and this goes for most of the tests, if they're trying to fake a good, for example, someone who is has a prison sentence or... Uh, incarcerated because they have a mental illness and they're tested periodically right and uh, they're trying to prove that they're well enough to get out then oftentimes these tests can detect whether someone's trying to fake good or someone who's trying to fake bad so there's a there's a lie detector element to many of these because what happens is, is that a person who's trying to fake good or fake bad tries too hard on the test right and then the scores come out a certain way. So certain questions will pick up on this fake good tendency or fake bad tendency, like in the MMPI out of the 300 questions. And then that scale would cross a certain threshold, and that makes that test invalid. It's like, well, we, it crossed that threshold of a certain number of points, and so we have to throw out this test because this person's not answering it uh, in a faithful way. They know they're trying to get away with something. Whew. Okay, we covered a lot of subjects here in terms of the field of personality. I hope you got something out of it. You saw many different perspectives, ranging from trait theories to cultural dynamics to the Neo-Freudians who evolved to create different psychoanalytic theories to Sigmund Freud himself. So I'm done here. Okay, if you have any questions reach out and contact me if you like. Thanks, and uh, till next time.